a special guest, Ben. He wanted to say hello. Oh my God, that's a great way to start things off. Yeah, the the man Bubba, get get him a little closer. Get get a, get a little bit of like a. Oh, there hi. we go. Bubba, you want to say hi? Oh my God, he's hi, so, so. he's so much bigger, man. Yeah, he's almost like 15, 16 pounds. He's massive. Yeah, so I've moved past the point of like trying to start these things off in like a in like a cool kind of a way, you know, like oh, welcome to the water. Like fuck that. Like everyone else is doing that. The only reason I was doing that in the first place because other people do it, and then I was like, ah, that's fucking stupid. So here we are. Um, the podcast is already going. Like like we're you know, like we're started. Um, plan for today, Wes. You kind of sent us over some questions, so we have that on the sort of in the sort of back of the mind here but i kind of want to just kick things off starting with like how the hell you found me because for you know people it's not like you have a platform and people know you uh but i know you because you found me on instagram and then you were like hey let's train and then you know we've known each other for a year now and we've trained in person and stuff so uh tell us tell us how you ended up in this sort of uh modern meathead lifestyle and uh what your background is insofar as fitness uh background or lack thereof yeah yeah okay cool so um, i grew up in south florida you know south florida a lot of people are are into uh into lifting weights and so uh i started going to the gym when i was i don't know maybe like 13 14 as part of like high school sports but then by high school it just evolved to going to the gym after school with one or two friends doing workouts from like bodybuilding.com and seeing a lot of you know bigger dudes in the in the gym you know wanting to to be like that when i was when i was older and so uh, continued lifting, you know, throughout college, um, but didn't really have any understanding of w- what I was doing. I, you know, was following programs again, like this is pre Instagram, um, fitness, Instagram, bodybuilding. So this is just like, you'd go to the gym with the buddy you do, you do one of those you know, 12, 16 week programs for bodybuilding.com. Um, and, and that was it, but I didn't, and I didn't really have a good understanding of the nutrition side. So, you know, I got some, some good results um definitely could have been way better had i you know understood the nutrition side of things and how important that was um and then um when i was 22 i went to work i worked in finance in the city here new york um and i i kind of wasn't really able to train for two years with any real degree of consistency um put on a bunch of weight um and, and wasn't happy and then so when i was like 25 um you know my first order of business was to kind of shed some weight get back in the gym and just start you know just start working out again and so did that for you know a year or two um again without any kind of real understanding of what i was doing you know b- b- bigger you know lots of bench press squats deadlifts you know just just things that you think you're supposed to do in the gym because that's what you, you know you've always done um but I, as i got a little bit older um you know i figured there must be a you know better way to do things i wanted to understand it because if i'm putting the time time into it i want to make sure that every you know minute that i'm in the gym um is well spent particularly as you get older you know you get shorter and shorter on time and so for me it was like wanting to step back and actually understand what i was what i was really doing what was the best way you know okay my goals were x y and z what's the what's the best most efficient way to get there you know least amount of time in the gym uh, and then also starting to get some pains and stuff, um, you know, like by the time I was you know, 27, 28, uh, I had some nice elbow tendonitis or whatever from, from doing skull crushers. Um, I tweaked something in like my, my back once deadlifting. So um, it, it was starting to get to a point where I knew I wanted to do this, you know, for decades. Right. And so it was, it was like, well, how do I do it most efficiently um, and how do I, um, how do I not get injured in the process? And so, you know, I started, you know, reading up. I think I found Joe Bennett maybe in like 2020, started doing some of his programs through Joe Bennett. I think that led me to Hunter Labrada, right? And so I was following him. And I think he started posting you a bunch. Um, and then I realized you were you were based here in New York City. And um, I kind of figured like if I was gonna, you know, take things to a, you know, a higher level with my own training, it was going to be helpful to have somebody, you know, with me in the gym, eyes, eyes on what I'm doing, uh, talk through things. And so decided to, uh, to reach out. I think that was like maybe a year and a half, not quite a year and a half ago, but something like that. Um, so yeah. by that point I had a, maybe a couple of years of like 
good training in terms of understanding at least some some basic understanding what I was doing. You know, again, like following uh, some of Joe Bennett's programs. You know, following Taz, following some of the people uh, who are you know considered thought leaders in the in the industry. And so um, that's how uh, that's how I came to found you know find you. And it's been it's been awesome ever since working with you. Wow. Well, well said. Very, very, very well sequenced. It's almost like you'd rehearsed it, but um, I'll pretend that you didn't. So uh, Ethan, <laughs> anything just insofar as like um, questions for, for Wes uh, related to his questions or anywhere that you want to start in terms of like anything about his story or his background or whatnot? I guess the next question is naturally where are you headed? What's next? Um, yeah, so for me, it's kind of at the point where, you know, I've been fortunate with the last few years, <clears throat> I've been pretty, um, I've been able to get in the gym, you know, more, more than you know, some years past, uh, it's, it's been it's something I've been able to focus on, you know, personally for me, you know, it's been those, uh, probably the next few months here, you know, year or whatever, uh, you know, transitioning to something different professionally, and that's going to take up probably, uh, you know, significant more amount of my time. And so, love to be able to kind of maintain where I'm at, you know, at least for the next, you know, six to 12 months, um, realizing that the time in the gym is, is, you know, going down. Um, and so, you know, may not be able to get, you know, five sessions in a week. And so, uh, for me maintaining, you know, next, next six to 12 months, uh, and then beyond that, you know, I'd love to keep, you know, keep progressing in, in the long run when we're talking about, you know, years or decades, and I'd love to be one of those guys you see in the gym there and there you know, in their fifties with a, you know, a great shape, uh, doing impressive things. So that's the, the long, long term and the medium term is, you know, kind of tread water here for a little bit. Um, and so that actually was where kind of the question came from. Ben was like, well, what do you want to, what do you want to know about? And for me, um, I want to doing something is typically like both feet in, um, and I want to do it the right way. I want to do it, you know, what's best. And so spending the last whatever, three or four years, you know, I'm trying to understand and do things, you know, optimally, um, now realizing that that may not be, uh, always feasible, you know, figuring out how you, you know, look at something more practically or pragmatically, you know, where the line is, you know, um, mentally and, you know, in terms of what you need to maintain versus progress and, you know, what is it appropriate to do things optimally and what is it appropriate to just, you know, get in the gym and, and do what you can. Um, and so that's kind of where the, the line of thinking came from. Yeah. So, I mean, the first Thought, Ethan, did, did you have a, a, a really burning thought there? Not necessarily. You know, like the first thing that comes to my mind when people are describing uh, the search for optimality is that I think, you know, optimum results as far as maximum results, if that's how we define it, comes, you know, right on the edge of issues. So you're kind of like teetering on that proverbial cliff. Uh, if that's really what's happening. Now, now, most times that's not what's happening. And that's why these questions are interesting. Uh, and the question being like, what problems have you run into in the you know pursuit of optimal? Because I think we could look at optimal sort of two ways. We could look at optimal as like this risk to reward cost to benefit ratio where there's some amount of input that you're willing to put in to get most of the output, kind of like the 80-20 sort of principle. And depending on what your goals are, that sort of optimal ratio can fall, um, you know, in different places along that continuum and, and sort of this like um, asymptotic curve that flattens out over time. So if you're trying to, you know, be the fastest person in the world, uh, you know, dropping one one hundredth of a second is, you know, astronomical in your progress. But if you're just trying to like, you know, run faster than, you know, your older brother or something, um, you know, the margins might be like, you know, significantly larger. Um, so it, it, in the same respect here, like, I think we have to define on one hand what we mean by optimal, which is like, is it optimal as far as like, you know, just your uh, cost benefit ratio? Or is optimal really mean like the maximum amount of progress? And in my experience, the people who are pursuing truly the maximum amount of progress usually have a, a lot of a, like slip ups, a lot of uh, you know problems in pursuit of that because they are teetering so close to the edge. So the question that I often ask in consults when someone is saying like, I'm pushing towards optimal, is it helps me to get an idea of 
where they're actually at based on, you know, what sort of problems they've incurred uh, in that pursuit. So Wes, that's, that's kind of the question for you, like in this pursuit of optimal, like what's been breaking for you in the last couple of years? Um, I guess I'm, I'm fortunate in that, um, and this is probably a function of, uh, I'm definitely, you know, a lifestyle client, right? Like I like, like living the, the lifestyle, but I, you know, I don't, don't compete, never have, you know, never have competed, don't plan on competing. So for me, there's always been the, I'm going to do, you know, what I can, but I'm not going to get, you know, I don't get too, too flustered when, uh, when something goes wrong. I think for me, the biggest thing I've been, as Ben has, has observed is, I always am super focused on trying to beat the, you know, weeks prior numbers or, or two weeks before that. And so, um, you know, could I maybe have progressed a little bit more, a little bit faster, maybe, maybe are there weeks when, especially when I'm training alone and I was then, you know, you know, is there some kind of form breakdown or, or there's something going on because I'm just so focused on like, okay, well, this is what the logbook says. This is the, the number of the reps that I really need to beat. Whereas, um, you know, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, as long as, you know, you, you could argue that, you know, in, intensity and, and technique and form are, are all more important than just, you know, beating, beating the logbook. So I think some of it is just, you know, once you have that mindset of like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. And it's in your, you know, in your head, it could be tough to, to beat that out. And so, you know, you can be your own worst enemy in terms of progress. Um, so that's probably, you know, I, I'd say the biggest one is just, you know, for me personally, is like letting go of the, the logbook from, you know, the last week or the session, two sessions prior, whatever, and just, you know, focusing on what matters versus, you know, making it too, too much of a competition against what I did a week ago. Yeah. And one, one of the things that I wanted to um, just interject there or just in relationship to this whole conversation is I think Ethan not being uh, privy to a lot of the bullshit that occurs on social media has a very different perspective on what you mean by the word optimal. Um, because Ethan is thinking of optimal in terms of like, what are the results that you're getting? And, you know, in terms of what you're seeing, what kinds of problems are you incurring or experiencing as a product of doing that? But in the, and this is, I'm sure that's, that's certainly part of it for you, Wes, but another part of it for you, I think, is uh, specific to like exercise selection and execution and, you know, the specificity of the exercises, because this whole optimal training movement is like a movement that's been spearheaded by, you know, originally the guys at N1, and then other people have sort of in various ways, you know, regurgitated a lot of the stuff incorrectly and, and sort of, uh, you know, I, I think that the overall messaging around the optimal training thing has been really, um, I think it's just been messy. Uh, and so it's led people to conclude uh, certain things that, you know, not related to the original message, uh, well, like me meaning, um, I don't want to speak about what specific people have said, but more so just the general theme of like people misunderstanding what optimal I think actually means. Because to me, like optimal is this relative term that shifts along a spectrum depending on where you're at. So for example, where you were six months ago, a year ago is very different from where you're going to be in a couple of weeks when you start this new job and you have no time on your hands, right? So the optimal scenario in either one of those cases needs to be contextualized to what is practically useful and relevant for you, right? So it's not, the question to me isn't, you know, optimal versus practical. It's, they're the same thing to me, right? Optimal is practical and practical is optimal. So there's no, there's no distinction to be made, I think, between, you know, let's say, because, and I think in a concrete sense, like, People now believe like a chest supported row is optimal for back training and a barbell row is non-optimal for back training. And I think the more appropriate way to maybe conceptualize that would be in certain contexts, the chest supported row will be optimal. And in certain contexts, the barbell row or the free rate, free weight row might be more might be more beneficial given the constraints of time given the constraints of equipment given the constraints of 
whatever else. So I think about optimal, even in the context of the exercise selection stuff as um, you know, dependent on a host of things that maybe we could get into more specifically if, if we want here. But just the notion that optimal is different than practical, I think needs to kind of be eradicated insofar as just people making this polarization of this over here is optimal and anything that moves away from that point is is practical or is less optimal. And I think that optimal is just kind of a, a moving target, if that makes sense if that makes a little bit more sense. So that's how I'm thinking about it, even from an exercise selection standpoint. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like optimal in this case is sort of defined by the constraints. It's just like, what's the best decision given the constraints that I've outlined, which then yeah, requires right. you to be honest about what the constraints are. My guess is that most people probably aren't very good at understanding and setting those constraints to begin with. And that probably makes the whole thing go to shit. But um, I understand conceptually, it's like, I've outlined these constraints that I believe to be true. And then within that, what's the best decision, um, you know, w w within that story? Yeah. Yeah, and, I, agree, I agree with that definition. And on a more like exercise specific note there too, just to kind of throw it in as, as an example, um, you know, I don't see... I don't see a super big problem with doing like a free weight row, let's say like where your, you know, erectors have to stabilize the load uh, versus like a chest supported row. But if you like, if you extract that same line of thinking and logic to other exercise comparisons, like let's say cable extension versus like barbell skull crusher, barbell skull crusher is just never an exercise that I would really give anyone at any point. Right. So it, so there are certain exercises that to me are all, almost always impractical from the standpoint of this is just not a thing that would even enter the stratosphere of, of my line of thinking to begin with. So just to, to, to clarify that, because there may have been some questions insofar as like, well, you say this one exercise, like I wouldn't do it. So, you know, but what if it's optimal for this person? And there are certain cases where I'm just like, this is not going to be practical for anyone given, given the constraints of the motion. Um, so then don't people just jump online then and go, well, well, what if only have, you know, a barbell? Like yeah. then, you know, is it, is it optimal then? Do, do people then just follow up with that? Like, because you can always create a situation where that's the best decision. Like no matter what the thing is, like you could contrive some situation where that's optimal. Like it might be wacky as hell, but there's like always going to be a situation where that's optimal. And I think that's the whole point of this podcast was like to give context, to actually have real people on with real problems and then, you know, get to those specific problems. So to hear Wes's story, and, you know, I know we're starting off by kind of just talking um, very broadly uh, on the topic, but pretty soon we'll get into specifically, you know, what Wes's issues are and, you know, how we address those specifically. But I think that's really the point of this podcast is to say that, like, optimal is really context specific. And without the context, you can't define it. Therefore, there's really no point in just, you know, saying a thing is optimal. It can only be optimal within a very specific environment. And therefore it just can't be applied broadly across all people. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in that context, I would, I would not, I would, I would still find a way around the skull crusher just as an FYI. <laughs> There's always a well, way around. I know, I know, I, I know one thing people like to obsess about online is what's the best, what's the best split or what split should I be doing? And yeah. so, uh, so something Ben and I have been spending some time on recently, um, and he's helped helped me with is, uh, you know, in a right. some people would argue that ideally, you know, if something's a priority, you're supposed to train it two times a week, and you know, there's there's nuances about you know if you're training legs, make sure your you know your lower back's not fatigued, so you don't maybe want to put, you know, your your back day right before your leg day, and there's there's all sorts of uh, you know, nuances and in a perfect world, if you have, you know, seven days of the week to, to design a training split, it can be different than I, you know, I gave Ben some constraints, for example, that, you know, I was only able to reliably train, you know, we, we said three, three days a week, which is down from the last number of years of trained five days a week. I've had a couple of leg days because legs were a priority. So one was more posterior dominant, one was more quad dominant. I was able to train arms twice a week because I trained them on, uh, push day, pull day, and then I had, had an arm day. 
So I've been able to train uh, five days a week, prioritizing the, the body parts that I want to see twice a week. Um, so basically moving away from that to a scenario where, okay, Ben, we've got three days to train, maybe a fourth day, um, you know, don't have anything at this point within that framework that's realistically, you know, be able to prioritize. Maybe we, you know, maybe we can add an arm day or something. But so for me with Ben, it was, it was moving away from, okay, here's this five days. We're going to train the priority stuff twice a week. We're going to design it. So the rest days are inserted where they should be to, these are the three days consecutively that to train. And then, so let's, let's work from there. And so figuring out what's optimal within that context was, was really helpful. Um, I don't know, so that's, a, that's a good real world example. Yeah, Ethan, so what kind of comes into your mind to begin with when you hear someone say something like that, where, you know, you have, you have effectively an unlimited amount of days that you could potentially train, and then you're transitioning someone into a period where now there are all of a sudden more constraints. And now let's say you only have three things or three days, uh, you know, whereas before you had unlimited time what are the kind of first things that like in a practical scenario that you would think to start with well i always just work backwards in terms of like what's the goal you know i'm always going to start with that so i i think wes has outlined that to a degree it sounds like he said and correct me if i'm wrong Wes, but the goal is is maintenance correct yeah exactly yeah I'd like to progress, but I'm also realistic in that, you know, it's probably a little bit harder for me at this point, but, you know, that's the other interesting question is, can you, can you continue to progress if you go from five days a week, you know, training the priority stuff twice a week to go just, you know, three, three days a week, you know, hitting them most likely once a week, you know, can you progress? But for, for me, the goal is maintenance, but it is an interesting question of, can you progress even when you move from, from, from point A like that to point B? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can definitely progress. I mean, you just got to look at what the other variables are, like what, you know, what's been your rate of progression? Like, what are the things that are, you know, potentially limiting you from progressing right now? Like, I don't put so much stock in, you know, purely training volume. Like, I think that's like been a really popular thing, you know, in something that like, I've definitely fallen into the trap of let's say five to 10 years ago when a lot of like the volume research was coming out on like, you know, number of sets. I think it's easy to just like, especially when you're natural and it's like, you only have a few tools to choose from. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, I train more, or I eat more mostly. Um, it's easy to fall into the trap that like the way that I make more progress is by doing more sets. Um, and when you look at acute training studies, it seems, you know, to support that point. But when you look, you know, at a bodybuilder across a career, it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, support that point. Or when you look, you know, between bodybuilders, like, I don't think the sort of acute story um, of, you know, doing more uh, sets is how you gain more muscle necessarily translates into like the, the long term story of, you know, how a career progresses. So, I'm definitely not like of the mindset that the major mover has to be like, you either do more sets, you know, or you don't progress. Um, so no, I absolutely think you could progress. And I wouldn't in the least bit be surprised if there were things that you could tweak, even if you were training less often that allowed you to still make progress, but it would basically come down to investigating like, one, where are sort of like the um, the rate limiting steps in your current progress? And two, you know, how much, you know, time, cost, health, you know, are you willing to like spend to get there? Uh, once you weigh those things out, again, just like, you know, mentoring the whole natural versus enhanced, like, it, I think it would be pretty straightforward. I don't think many people would disagree if like you cut your training volume in half, but you started taking drugs you would make more progress than you made with double the training volume. So th that to me would, you know, <clears throat> be pretty clear. I'm not, not suggesting, you know, recommending or, you know, condoning that as, as Broderick uh, Chavez would say, but I'm just pointing out that that is um, over, a very like overt example of you could do less training volume and make more progress. The same would apply to like 
if you were in a hypocaloric state, if you were dieting and you were doing, you know, more training volume, and then you, you know, cut your training volume and you started eating more calories. My guess is there's probably some weak links somewhere where you could train less and still make about the same amount of progress. Um, but that's just simply a guess based on, you know, doing a lot of these, you know, consultations over time. So we, we can kind of dig into if you want what those things are. But I think conceptually, like just going down to three workouts a week, you know, doesn't guarantee that you automatically, you know, halt progress. Wes, so where are you fucking up, man? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I, I think I think the big thing that I probably should have mentioned at the kind of when I when I brought it up was that I would assume that, you know, uh nutrition and, and sleep and recovery are all equated for. Um so it'd actually be interesting to see, um, you know, the, the, my guess is, you know, that those will be okay. Um, and I think like had I, you know, be like, I insisted on adding a, you know, fourth or fifth day that would directly come at the expense of sleep, for example, or recovery. So I think, you know, trying to keep those as equated as possible. So eating at maintenance, like what I've been doing for the last you know, month or so. Um, making sure I continue to, you know, prioritize getting, you know, as much sleep as I realistically can. Um, those would be the, you know, the assumptions in that question. But yeah, I totally agree. You know, if for some reason, you know, sleep goes off a cliff and nutrition, you know, is all over the place. Then I think, you know, it's likely that you, you know, you take a step backward. Um, similarly, if, if for some reason going to three days, you know, leads to like much better sleep or more sleep or, you know, allows, you know, for even further consistency with nutrition or something, then it's, yeah, it's probably possible that there's some, some incremental gains to be had. Um, but yeah, those things are, are super important. I, I completely agree. I, th I think no, that, I well, one of the things, Ethan, that you and I have uh, talked a lot about just in, you know, in private, specifically in relationship to me at different points is just the recognition and the realization that like if you have been training for some time and you've been uh you know on top of all the things that you should be on top of and you are you know if you stay natural like progress is just like slow as fuck and it just only gets slower and i think a lot of times when uh you know people maybe get to wes's point uh, they, they maybe say something along the lines of like, well, but you know, my progress is stalled when in reality, maybe their progress is fine. And like Wes has made a lot of progress over the last year or so, especially, um, um, you know, maybe it's simply just the time frame a lot of the time that you're actually, you know, that, that your perspective is sort of focused on, um, because a lot of times that, that also is the case with, you know, things like exercise progression where people will not, you know, maybe add reps or load in a week or two weeks or or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, and maybe their relative perspective on just how much they should be adding to that exercise in terms of how much absolute load is, is being used is just sort of uh, misaligned, you know, so like people will say, you know, I can't add load to my dumbbell lateral raise, uh, you know, and it's because they're adding, you know, five pounds on the 15 pound dumbbells that they're using, right? So you're trying to add fucking 25% load on an exercise that uh, is is relatively difficult to progress. And I feel like that equivalent happens a lot with people that get to that sort of like intermediate stage where there's like a clear point where you you are not seeing progress as much. And the, it's sort of like the mindset and, and, the, and the paradigm just needs to shift toward like not expecting to continue to make that progress. Uh, I feel like that's, you know, a, a mental roadblock that a lot of people who take this seriously sort of run into. Um, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like an impasse in a psychological sense, but not really a physical sense, you know, because like Wes has no reason to believe, I think at this point, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Wes, but like, I feel like you, you have been making progress and you are making progress. And um, there's no reason really to expect that you're not going to continue to, or at least to stay where you are with, with these changes. Um, it, so it feels like a lot of, you know, your um, potential issues right now are much more just like psychologically related, like 
uh, anxiety related about the potential to not be making progress in the future, rather than like, you're not seeing progress now because you're fucking this thing or this thing or this thing up. And so what do you do? It's almost like, it's almost like um, a lot of it is, you know, not to diminish it, but it's in your head. You know, it's not necessarily in the, in the evidence that you have. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, so Wes, you had mentioned like, you had put on some weight like in your early 20s once you started in finance when you were in college like were you roughly the same body fat you are now or did you start off as like a, a no person? I was definitely no I started off when so when I started off I was really skinny I just always been uh you know I don't even remember how what I weighed when I went into college but I was like you know string bean in high school put on a little bit of weight I was actually in, in better shape uh, in high school in terms of body fat, but got bigger in college, both because lifting, but also because my diet was terrible. I was drinking a lot, you know, doing, doing things that normal, you know, uh, a lot of college kids do. And so it, it kind of masked the, you know, there, there's muscle gain, but there's also definitely fat gain. I think when I graduated college, I was probably uh, the softish, you know, 165 maybe. Um, and I think, that was so that was age 22 by the time i was 24 i got up to the mid 180s um and it was you know barely it was definitely a, a fluffy you know mid 180s it was not not great so then i dieted so then when i was like 20 you know, i was 24 25 dieted basically down from like very slowly over the course of maybe a year year and a half went from like 185 call it all the way down to like 155 um and it was not fun, but, you know, just really it, consistent with the diet and cardio. I think I was doing uh, probably two, three days a week of, of pretty, you know, pr cardio sessions that were not, not particularly fun. Wow. Um, and then, so cardio. Got, got, Impressive. Yeah. Uh, so it got, got all the way down to like, I want to say around mid, yeah, mid 150s, 155. And then, and then over the past, yeah, over the past three years, basically went from 155 to, you know, low 170s currently about the same body fat, I'd say maybe a little bit higher today than, than where I was at the absolute low. But um, so that's, I guess, you know, maybe somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds over three years um, with roughly, you know, roughly equivalent body fat, maybe again, a little bit higher today. Since I've been working with Ben, since I came to Ben, you know, having a few years of like good training, good nutrition under my belt, I came to Ben, I think, we started working together, Ben, it was, it was around 165, maybe a little bit shy of that. And then over the course of working together, went, went up to kind of low, low 180s um, and then took way back down to kind of low 170s. So net, net, like maybe five, six pounds of, of muscle gain over the past year. Um, Maybe it's maybe it's not all muscle, but you know, roughly five pounds, I'd say, over the course of, I don't know, I think maybe 14, 15 months of working with with Ben, um, roughly similar body fat to where where I was when we started. That's the course of like my training history and you know how to, how it relates to to body weight. Um, and just kind of yeah, so the progression is obviously much much slower over the last twelve months than it was, you know, in the twenty four to thirty six months prior to that. I mean, it sounds like. Can you guys hear me all right now? Just give me a thumbs up or something. Yeah. Okay, it was freezing a little bit on my end, but so, you know, when thinking about like training history versus say like you know muscle gain history in terms of like really pushing up body weight like having things uh in the realm of you know what you guys would call like you know the direction of optimal um it really has only been like a year year and a half or whatever it was like okay you're drinking shitty lifestyle in college even shittier lifestyle after leaving college i'm assuming you're still training a little bit but not a lot during that period and then you know you have some period of you know a couple years or whatever where like you had a period of dieting where you dropped hey, down to like yeah. 155 again 
not really gaining a whole lot of muscle during that period if you're dieting. Maybe a little bit if you were just super lazy in the early 20s. But in, as far as like, you know, eating in a hypercaloric state um, and, you know, training, um, you know, with some degree of like regularity um, and, you know, efficacy, um, it's still it's still only on the order of like maybe a couple years. It's about three. Yeah, it's, it's about it's about three three years. I'd say it was, it was definitely it's kind of twenty twenty was when I learned to put the pieces together properly. Just stopped stopped dieting um, and started you know started focusing on putting on the lean lean tissue. So I'd say mm-hmm. it's been yeah this for so the past year with Ben or year plus. Let's call it you know year three. Maybe something a little bit shy of that in terms of where where I'm at in terms of training and and just to to give some additional context too so in each of those three years there was definitely a period of you know call it three months where I try to clean up and you know lose a little bit of weight because things were getting a little bit slow so in each year you know maybe 70 75 percent of the year was spent uh in a surplus you know and then the rest of it would be either you know moderate deficit or or maintenance um so you know I guess so when you think about like the, and I forget what the, you know, theoretical limits of like, you know, natural, natural ability to put on muscle in a given year are, but I think kind of given, you know, it's year, year three call it, I think it's five pounds if that's, you know, pretty decent in terms of progress. So I feel like the progress we've been seeing over the last year is, is pretty solid when you take that into account. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. But it sounds like you're maybe kind of in that, like, intermediate ish stage now where like I, I wouldn't consider you someone who's like well you're just gonna you're just at the point right now where like the gains are gonna be imperceptible and like you're gonna have to just look at like micro progressions and you're barely gonna notice it year to year. Like I, I would be very surprised if that was you at this point. Also like there haven't been periods from what I'm hearing that are just like you push the limits of like how much food you can eat. You got up, you know, super high in body weight. Like you probably got to a point where you didn't like the way you look, but not necessarily a point <laughs> where it's like um, you've, you've consistently been in a, a hypercaloric state where you just can't feasibly eat anymore. Your body weight is, you know, not far off from like where, uh, where your peak was previously, even if it was kind of fatter. It's not like there was a period where you're 200 pounds. Um, You're kind of, but you're still like, oh, somewhat around that baseline of like where that college body weight was, where that slightly over fat body weight was. There's not this like, you know, huge jump from baseline where you're say like 200 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. I I call it a big recomp over time is the best way that you could probably, (laughs) you know, phrase it. Um, and also for yeah, the context, I, I, I'm, I'm five. I'm five eight, by the way. For for context, I feel like you know, Ben Ben knows that, and if you've seen, but that's that's my height. What Wes is trying to tell you that he's a that with, Wes is trying to tell you that he's short. a short king, and that he can't, you know, he he won't be that heavy, you know, or else he'll just look like an oompa loompa, you know. <laughs> that's that's Which might, this isn't a bad thing. I actually, you know, I respect that look, but I I don't think I can get there myself, at least naturally, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with, with what you're, that you're saying, Ethan. Yeah. I mean, I'd be willing to bat like the kind of, you know, just long, slow recomp sort of thing over time is like, you know, somewhat a product of a couple of things. Like I'm sure the like social media sort of like mini cut movement shit has like somewhat to do with that. Like I'm <laughs> sure, you know your goals have something to do with that in terms of like, you know, not looking to step on stage, but, you know, you just want to look, you know, pretty good most of the time, you know, slowly make progress without like too many, you know, ups and downs along the way. Um, But I think there is a place, you know, at least at some point during your journey to kind of like, you know, push things up a little bit further than you might think. Um, I kind of get the sense in this, like, optimality world that we're that you guys were describing earlier that there's a little bit of just like 
fearfulness around kind of like pushing limits and like maybe some of the messaging has come down from you know people who have pushed the limits too far and like seen problems from it but then the pendulum can kind of swing too far the other way where it's just like yeah uh, we're just kind of playing this like in this safe zone and just you know go for kind of like you know the the low-hanging fruit um my guess is like if you did really try to push your body weight up and and really like dialed all the switches up that there would still there would be some like large gain like in your uh you know in 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 the realm of possible you usually see at some point yeah. during someone's career if they really push the food really push the training like probably the scope of what you've seen in that respect based on like the people you're following uh only like, like has a limited view on what optimal is you know where it's like if optimal is to, is just kind of this like friendly zone versus like you step into a different environment like a different gym around like people who have a very different idea of what optimal is i wouldn't be surprised if there is actually a lot more there that just kind of like the fluffing the fluffing i'm going to make that word up of like social media like kind of you know hides us from in this day and age i don't know ben maybe you have a take on that like it, it's probably hard from the perspective you're coming in at but like where I'm looking at it from, I just think like these words like optimal just give me the sense that like there is kind of like a, a softening that uh, lives in that realm as well. Yeah. So I think um, so. I think that uh, and, and I think this is why like guys who have quote you know been in the trenches kind of have um negative reactions to the word now is because uh the the idea of optimal and optimal exercise i think is now something where it's like people who are having their introductions to this stuff are being exposed to the word optimal and what they i think assume is that you know, the more optimal that they can make this exercise, the more optimal they can make their split, the more optimal they can make their rep selections and their set numbers and all those things, the less total work that they're going to have to do. So it's kind of like, rather than the optimal stuff being a solution to a problem that they're encountering, it's like, that's their starting point. And because it's their starting point, they end up never getting to the point where they're running into issues because they're pushing things to the degree that they need to be pushed eventually. And so, you know, in your case, Ethan, the optimal mechanics shit, like that was something that was hyper relevant and very helpful to you directly, right? Like not needing to go to PT and massage because now like your joints don't feel like, you know, uh, crummy in the same kind of ways. So I think that rather than being a solution for most people now, it's like an introduction point and it's like a place for people to start, um, which is why the people who, again, who have been in this game a long time, I think get frustrated at seeing people enter the space that way because, um, because you know, they're, they're essentially looking for solutions that are not the appropriate solutions for the problem that they have, right? It's like, People are looking oftentimes, I think, in the wrong direction or at the wrong variable or at the wrong nuance. And I think that it's helpful. You know, the exercise shit obviously is, is pivotal. It's, 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 um, it's imperative to, to understand, I think, and to know, if not immediately, then at some point. Um, but I think that people end up getting lost in that sort of sauce without ever actually getting to a point where it becomes the, you know, the relevant question for them is like, how do I optimize this exercise? So I understand just kind of like implicitly why, you know, older grungier folks are like angry at the whole idea of it and the whole movement. And I think if those people can't necessarily articulate why they're angry about it, I think that that's why is that, um, you know, people haven't experienced what they have experienced and are looking for solutions that they don't need. They're kind of looking in the wrong area if that makes sense. Yeah, that was super helpful. Um, so yeah, in the, um, you know, in the interest of being less uh, cynical, 
let's uh, <laughs> let's get down to brass tacks and like see if we can, you know, provide some real world solutions here. So Wes, like uh, just walking away from today, like what do you think would be most helpful? Like what, you know, what, what would you like to uh, accomplish on the call today? So I will, uh, I will say that I had the, uh, the, the luxury of, of uh, getting with Ben on Friday and, and sitting down for an hour with a whiteboard going through kind of day by day, you know, how to structure the training, um, you know, the thought process behind it, et cetera. So had we not done that, it, it probably would have been um, the real, that would have been the, the, the most helpful thing. I don't know, Ben, if it's worth kind of recapping how you went about kind of a, uh, designing a three day consecutive day split with an optional four day, um, you know, with no particular emphasis, um, I guess maybe arms the way we did it, but maybe, you know, for, for anybody listening, if, if you want to give like a recap of, of kind of how you went about designing it and, and then what you came up with and then the way that you laid it out in terms of, you know, giving, uh, you know, mo movement and pat whatever, you know, emphasis on what we were trying to do versus prescribing specific exercises was interesting also. So I don't know, I'd say, you know, I, I personally, I had the benefit of that, but for everybody else, that was definitely the big thing that I was hoping to get with from Ben. Um, so I pr that's probably the best, best way to kind of, Help help anybody listening who's who's maybe thinking about how to how to go out there training split with uh, some serious time constraints. Yeah, uh, I think that could be helpful, and then maybe we'll just kind of go kick it back to you. Insofar as like anything else, um, so the way that I looked at it was basically like um, I, I think it's helpful just to start with like a, a volume constraint uh, and just being practical about that. So Wes like hasn't really needed. And I think most people don't need super uh, high volumes in general. Like I think people are under the impression, like when people purchase like a program for my website, they're often like, why is there so low volume? And I, and you know, because people I think are used to doing like a thousand sets with, you know, junk exercises with no sets to failure. And so um, Wes basically has been operating under the uh, sort of like higher intensity, lower set uh, number, uh, paradigm. And so I think previous to this, we were doing about, depending on muscle group, it was like anywhere from like, you know, six to 12 sets, again, depending on muscle group and not really accounting too much for overlap. Um, and so that's kind of just where I wanted to try to stay, but more toward the lower end of that range, um, you know, maybe six to 10 per, per group. So uh, what we ended up settling on and I think that multiple things sort of affected this directly insofar as like you know Thursday Wes wasn't a hundred percent sure that he'd be able to get to the gym so we were like looking for something that he could do in his apartment and then you know Friday Saturday looked like more like for sure gym days that he could you know uh get apartment in there gym. or or the apartment gym yeah yeah apartment, apartment gym yeah, yeah, to yeah, clarify yeah. it's not like a full yeah. yeah yeah um so that was like a constraint that we were dealing with. And I think that's the most important place to start is like, what days do you know that you can train and what days uh, or, or where on those days do you know that you can train? Like what, what are things that you know that you can 100% subscribe to and, you know, start with as little as we feel like we need. And where we ended up with that was basically just like a push pull uh, legs, sort of a split. And so it's basically, you know, a one time a week frequency type thing where we're doing a little bit higher volumes for fewer muscle groups on one day. And we ended up, I think, anywhere in the range of like, you know, six to 10 sets per muscle group per the whole week, which if those are hard sets, I think is actually for a lot of people um, enough and more than more than enough if the quality of those sets are, are high. Um, and then we basically just divided up the push pull leg weeks into a and b weeks so um you know week a uh, has slightly different emphasis just in terms of the specific muscular bias as week b but because there are tons of overlaps between you know certain exercises that we were choosing we you know i wasn't too worried about like not getting enough of a stimulus in a certain day so like a pull day 
the way we would lay it out would be like, you know, this is generally going to be like a more vertically, uh, you know, oriented pole thing. And with that, we're going to pair something that's more horizontally oriented. And with that, we're going to pair some sort of biceps thing uh, in addition to, you know, maybe some stuff that's more specific to, to upper back, just because, you know, it might not get touched as much in the other stuff. So, you know, without getting too like, um, um, too specific about any of the, uh, of the um, exercise selections, what we tried to do is we tried to lay out, um, you know, general stimulus from the perspective of like, rather than saying you're going to do this specific lat motion, you know, we're going to do the Nautilus lat pull down. Uh, we just said, we're going to do a more vertically oriented lat thing. And I think that that's a good way to start out, you know, start laying out a framework as you, you sort of cover your basis with just like, um, not necessarily exercise names, but rather um, descriptions of what you're trying to accomplish with the exercise. Because when you sort of constrain yourself to specific exercises, if you find yourself in a situation where um, you know, you're not able to use a particular piece of equipment on a certain day, you kind of st start to run into problems with like, oh, well, what do I do? Rather than saying, you know, I have this idea of what a vertical uh, you know, pulling motion should look like for this specific tissue, for this portion of the lower lat, for, you know, the teres or the rear delt. Like if you understand, generally speaking, the anatomy and the physics at a very basic level, regardless of where you are and what happens on any specific week, you can kind of make it work given the constraints of, you know, your average uh, gym. So we basically laid it out, push, pull legs, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, where we knew that he could get into the gym. And then on Sunday, we just wrote out like an optional, you know, arm day with some extra arm volume that he could just, you know, go downstairs at the apartment gym and get done with uh, some some cables. So, you know, that's basically kind of how we went through it. And, um, you know, we easily, given different constraints, could have laid it out in any other different way. Like every day could have been like a full body day with different, you know, uh, emphases. You know, you could have done something like full body, full body, full body, where the first day was, you know, like a lat and uh, quad emphasis. And then the next day was like a pec and uh, hamstring and calf emphasis and, you know, so on and so forth. So I think people really with these types of situations run into roadblocks when they put themselves into boxes without realizing it, right? There's like a certain sort of subconscious level of programming that I think everyone is operating under, um, you know, with certain things like, even just the idea of like training lats on the same day as calves or, you know, like just those sorts of things. Like we've all, I think, been been programmed to condition in ways that we're not aware. And when it comes to the programming stuff and just figuring these kinds of situations out, I think people unconsciously and unknowingly um, constrain themselves before they even get started. And so, uh, you know, you, you, you sort of start with a much more narrow framework of what's possible rather than just being open to literally anything, you know, uh, 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 being done. And I think that like, at the end of the day, for me, it really just comes down to like, am I doing the amount that I think that I should be doing for each group within this specific time frame? And if so, I'm, you know, happy with that. I'm a lot less worried about like, am I recovering, you know, on the next day? Am I, am I, am I sore? Like all those subjective markers I think can be useful, but I think overall people, uh, find ways to um, create noise where there doesn't really necessarily need to be any. And I think that especially with a, you know, a new adjustment or, or an adjustment to a new schedule, you're going to run into new problems and then, you know, you can solve those problems when you get there. But I think an important thing to also make sure of is, is not to kind of create problems before you actually encounter them. So just being willing to be like, hey, let's try this and like, see what the fuck happens rather than trying to, you know, make the perfect plan, because the perfect plan is always going to be a kind of moving target, uh, depending on how you sort of interact with, you know, what you've laid out with, uh, or what you've laid out initially. So I'm not sure if yeah. anything else comes up from that, but. No, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. And, and I don't know, uh, Ethan, if you had anything, but if, if not, you know, I, I guess the, the one last thing to, to your question, Ethan, was, you know, what do you want to leave here with, but it would be, you know, for the last however, you know, few years, I, I've been, you know, I haven't had to cue in, you know, super closely in terms of paying attention to, you know, specific beats. So I've been able to just track, you know, body weight, you know, look, uh, you know, progress in the gym. Um, 
but now that you know things are changing more on a more wholesale level in terms of my you know schedule training um are there any other things that you know you guys would say you know you should you know cue into in terms of pay special attention for whether it's you know biofeedback you know tracking things in the gym you know i know ben actually mentioned you know actually maybe you should track a little bit less in the gym and just get in get some hard training sessions in and don't don't worry too much about the logbook but what sorts of things you know w would you guys pay attention to in terms of you know uh assessing you know how the new you know new schedule new 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 training program is going or would you just kind of stick to the thing things that i've always looked at which is you know just really body weight look uh you know logbook progression um, or there's anything else that, you know, obviously sleep, I guess, too, but appetite, you know, anything outside the ordinary that you would, you would try to look into to, to, you know, make a decision as to whether, you know, or assess, you know, how it's working, what needs to be adjusted, you know, in, in a month or three months, six months from now. The situation I lean towards, just like based on hearing your story, I lean towards tracking almost nothing. Um, I think when the goal is, you know, to really dial up progress and, you know, you kind of have your ducks in a row. Um, look, at the end of the day, most metrics just kind of confirm other things. It's just like no one metric, you know, paints the whole story, but you sort of already know subjectively when things are going well. And those metrics just tend to, you know, confirm what you already know. So even if we have like, you know, a DEXA scan or MRI or something like that, none of that stuff's really accurate enough, like within an individual to track the same muscle gain over time. So if anything, we're mostly just relying on a lot of like subjective measures. Yes. Like, you know, potentially tracking your body weight. Yes. Like, are you getting stronger? But like, when are you not getting stronger? Like, I don't really, I know like coming from, a pro bodybuilder that sounds kind of like, oh, you know, it might, might be the case for you, but like I've trained a lot of people in, in the last like 15 years and, you know, in an acute period of time, like you make progress when you're switching exercises, you're switching, um, you know, like program design, at least for some period of time, you tend to make progress. And then I find like most people don't really have the consistency where you can look back over you know, three years and say like, oh, you know, under these contexts I did or, you know, didn't make progress because there's just so many moving parts in general, like you, you tend to just know, um, are things going well or things not going well? And then the statistics tend to like, just confirm what you already know. And this is coming from a person who typically takes, you know, a lot of notes, uses a, a, a decent amount of metrics historically. But what I would say is like, those things are probably going to come at a period when you're purposely dialing things back up. When you've just decided like emotionally that you want to put energy toward, you know, back towards like gaining muscle. And that's the priority. That's when I would prioritize tracking those things. And I don't think like tracking maintenance, like I don't think any amount of tracking is really going to like change your decision making in this situation. So I would just think of it as like, how do I gain the most amount of like, um, like reserve of excitement for the next time that I want to push? So if you already know that you're basically going to be maintaining for a period and you say, well, I'm going to maintain, but at like, you know, 80% of my like total effort. Um, if you could have maintained at like 50% of your total effort, in my mind, that 30% is just kind of wasted. Like I would rather just have easy be easy. And then when you decide to dial things up, like emotionally put your energy towards that. Like it should be relatively easy to maintain. And I would just kind of bask in the, the fact that like you can make it easy and you can do things in this period that you couldn't have otherwise done. So, you know, take advantage of the seasons. Like when it's a season where, uh, you know, you can do less, you can explore other things, whether that be a job, a hobby. You know, I, I lean towards just diving into those things 
and like um, letting those, you know, be the priority for a little while, because, you know, an extra 10% of effort when you've already set parameters, which are going to like keep you at maintenance, I don't think really move the needle. So I would do the least amount possible during this time, the least amount of like, not just uh, time, but just emotional energy towards it. Try to have some fun with it. And then when it's time to dial it back up, you should be craving it. Like if you're a person who really loves to train and really loves to see progress, you know, in the gym or in your body, after a certain amount of time, you just get so hungry for it. Um, that your results get exponentially better. I think, Wes, much like that time where you gained a little bit of weight, training wasn't going so great, then all of a sudden you got excited about learning, excited about you know training again, and things went really well. I, I would think of it that way. Like, think of it as this is a period where you're going to back off a little bit, but it's actually just going to make it that more interesting when you return to it, rather than saying, like, I'm just going to, you know, kind of keep the pedal on the gas, even though I'm not really going anywhere. Yeah. And knowing, knowing Wes, Ethan, um, Wes is someone who is very, who struggles with doing less and pulling away and being okay with pulling away from training and tracking and those sorts of things. And to me, one of the things that really stood out, you know, uh, Ethan, during your sort of injury period was that I felt like my perception was that like, I was surprised by how well it seemed like you were able to sort of pull away from things and like kick back and relax a little bit. And maybe there was like some sort of unspoken, like, you know, anxiety around not training certainly, but it felt like you were really able to none. Yeah. You were sort of able to like hone in on just like relaxing. So I think some practical tips for, for Wes and for other people around, like, how do you sort of how do you sort of get to a point where you're actually okay with doing less and where you're, you know, you know, you're not super anxious about losing progress and you're not super anxious about a return to training being really difficult. If you're just at maintenance, you know, and you know, you know what you need to do, you know, to be at, to be at that level where you're kind of maintaining the status quo while continuing to train and, you know, eat, you know, eat properly, but maybe not, you know, to the degree that you're really pushing one way, you know, body weight up or down or anything. You know, if you could do that at 50%, you know, effort, you know, you use that to your advantage and, you know, rather than pushing it like 80% just to hang out at maintenance. And so, you know, repurposing that time to other, you know, things that in, in your life. So in my case, you know, yeah, that's, uh, you know, work and stuff at home. And so it makes, it makes total sense. Um, and I'm happy to get that time back. Like Ben said, it's, it's the, the mental aspect um, of doing that is definitely, you know, tougher. Cause like I said earlier, you know, it's, when I'm doing something, I like to be kind of all, all in. Um, but I get where you're, what you're saying. I think here, hearing it from both of you guys, obviously, is really helpful. Um, you know, two two really good perspectives. Um, so you know, I think I'll do that, and then uh, it'd be interesting. Obviously, I'm gonna you know have have you know somewhat routine, uh, you know, check ins with Ben, just let him know how it's going, get get his thoughts. Um, but you know, maybe three three to six months time, I'll hop back on, let you guys know how it's going um you know tell you any issues i ran into uh and and we can we can kick it around and see you know what the expectation was what actually transpired um and then you know any practical you know things that i worked through along the way um but it made for it made for an interesting an interesting follow-up but uh in the meantime i think what you guys said makes a lot of sense yeah i mean Wes, earlier i mentioned like i do think you still have periods where you can make significant progress like just on average if i had to make the, make an assumption based on your story and the stories that i've heard of many people in the past so really the key to that is just having periods where you're really excited not like a kind kind of excited but like really motivated you know when you go through and, and i find this with a lot of kind of like the general population, like body composition, sort of in that like quasi um, maintenance realm, where it's like, you know, body weight's more or less going to be the same, want to be pretty lean year round. It's easy to get into lulls where things are, 
technically just flat for a long time. And it really takes shaking things up. Like it takes meeting someone like Ben, you know, where you saw that dramatic, you know, increase in progress. It, it takes, you know, going to a, a new gym or, or moving states or some type of just like shift in your life and shift in your perspective and mentality to really bump things up. Like, I, I don't think it's so much just like searching for these, you know, little things here or there where you're at right now, I think more than anything, it's just about being really excited and being around, you know, the right people and the right environment. So with that in mind, like, I think if anything, it's, it's good that things are kind of getting shaken up. And I think to embrace that with the mindset of if I come down for a little while, just like any athlete would, like, if someone was preparing for the, you know, Olympics over four years, or some type of like long-term endeavor, like there's planned rest, you know, along the way and significant planned rest after that. You know, I know a lot of bodybuilders who might take, you know, four plus months off, like from training completely after a show. And that, that's certainly not like a recommendation to, you know, people who aren't in that position. My point is just that like, the harder you push, the more emotionally invested you are in something, the more you actually realize how much, uh, how relevant downtime is because you realize just how high the highs can be. Um, and I think if anything right now, Wes, it's just like, how do you put yourself in a position to experience another one of those highs where you just want to be in the gym? You want to like, you know, just go out of your way to, to, to meet new people, to like, um, you know, train on new equipment and, when you have that sort of excitement, that sort of like zest, I think it just pushes things that like you couldn't otherwise predict or otherwise sort of like, um, you know, manage from like a scientific perspective. So if a season comes along where you're, where, whether by injury, by, by job change, by, uh, you know, relationship or what have you, I think just embracing that like, this is not just something I'm being forced to do, but kind of just this natural opportunity to step away from the mindset and the environment you're in right now so that later on you can return with just like a renewed sort of fervor for this whole thing. Um, I think you'll see over the course of like a training career that the progress is not linear. Like it, it, it comes in sort of these like quantum leaps. And I think you know, either by, by chance, which it often is, you know, or by design, you can sort of set yourself up for those quantum leaps versus that mindset of, I'm just going to kind of like, you know, chip away at this, you know, for, uh, you know, for years and years and bits and bits. Um, I absolutely think that's requisite to a degree, but I think where you're at right now, the biggest driver is going to be excitement. And I think, there's an opportunity to sort of set yourself up for another phase of that in, in say a, a year or so. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. Great thoughts. Um, super helpful perspective. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. and also just a point to add there too um, is that's only, you know, a perspective I think that can be formed through years of experience and, you know, having to kind of find the intentionally those time periods where you can make yourself more motivated and more excited because there's a big difference between those time periods and the time periods where you're technically on paper doing all of the same things, but the psychology behind, um, you know, what's driving you is very different. Like, I think that's, I think there's a big, um, important point to be made around being in a good state to be able to to you know pursue those times um but i think that that also it doesn't just apply on like a long term time scale it also applies on you know a relatively smaller scale right so like this time period of having to pull away from the five or six days of training that you've been doing the last few years two three may actually be within a week the same sort of, uh, you know, stimulus, if you want to call it that, for you to, you know, sort of rekindle your excitement around training, eventually sort of leading toward maybe adding more data. Uh, adding more. 
um, eventually just leading to, you know, more days over time where you, you know, show up to the gym and you end up more excited as a product of, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe you don't train from, you know, Sunday all the way to Thursday, that sort of micro scale of, you know, that time being sort of forced, uh, you know, away from the gym. I think that's kind of like a microcosmic, if you want to call it that example of what Ethan's describing on a longer term, uh, you know, scale. And that may end up over time, you know, you, you sort of just build up this reservoir of like excitement, you know, only training three days a week, where not only within each week, are you excited to, to be in the gym on those days, but then you become excited for future, you know, bouts of progression where you actually can push it a little bit more and adhere to the gym, you know, five, six days a week. Uh, you know, if you eventually want to. So I think that's a, a kind of like a, a good um, uh, takeaway from from that message is that it can also occur on a very small time scale, even even a time scale as small as a day, right? Just like being able to kind of get in and out of the mindset of like this is the West that is like someone who loves to lift. Um, you know, for me, that like at the end of the day. Uh, is just like spending time with my girlfriend and like watching a show that's just totally just takes my mind, you know, away from all things that I'm currently, you know, occupied with. It's just like learning to sort of make that thing uh, or that concept a reality within each day and not getting too wrapped up in the things that you're constantly already wrapped up in. You know, I used to definitely, especially in college, be like 24 seven, just enamored with this process. And eventually you, you just find, I feel like over time that you can't sustain that degree of focus and, and motivation, you have to intentionally carve out those periods. Um, you know, whether it be through something like this job change or through something like, um, you know, your intention, um, you know, outside of that, I think that's a really important lesson, you know, long-term to kind of embody. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. And, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, most likely what I'm going to find is, is kind of like, if I can only train three days, I'm going to really look forward to those days. And so maybe there's, you know, some, some nice surprises in terms of progression yeah. that I you know didn't foresee as a result of that. So yeah. uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting, interesting to, to see kind of firsthand. Yeah. I think it'll be cool. I would definitely love to get you on, you know, in a couple months time to kind of see like what the real updates were. And then we can kind of, uh, it'll be fun because we can kind of build off of this conversation and see where you're at then and just, you know, problem solve for the next set of issues that you're running into. Perfect. Yeah, it sounds good. Thank you both for, uh, you know, helping me brainstorm, think through things and uh, set me up for success here. So we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch. All right, man. Fantastic. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. All right. Thanks. Bye. Peace.